Thank you. Thank you, Gandhi. Hi, warm welcome to everyone and good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us for this wonderful, wonderful session. Um, you know, here today. Uh, you know, everyone in in their lives have gone through or will go through, you know, periods of their life when uh, you know a, a certain incident or a certain period in life is pivotal and it changes who they are. It influences what they become, you know, personally, professionally. And, and I would say the time that I spent with the Azim PNG Foundation was that pivotal space for me. And, you know, whether it was the people I met, the insights I got into education and into the public and the government education system, the opportunity of working across districts um, with the government system and the opportunity of working with wonderful leaders out there. So I, Anurag, I, you know, that's a space that will always stay with me and and will always be special for me. So when Mukun said, hey, you have to host this, the, the, the difficult part for this hosting was, how do I introduce Anurag? And I think the more appropriate question is, which Anurag do I, uh, do I really introduce? So do I talk about um, Anurag, who's the Chief, Chief Sustainability Officer at Wipro, or Anurag, who's the CEO of Azim Premji Foundation and Vice Chancellor of Azim Premji University? Or more interestingly, the Anurag, who's the avid traveler, uh, the health enthusiast, uh, the long distance runner and athlete, the music aficionado. And I don't know if you're still a, a crazy Lada fan, Anurag, but I do remember those evenings when we'd have long conversations about, uh, about music. Or Anurag, who's the columnist. And you know, we've all read over the years, his columns and insightful pieces on on systems change and education in the mint. But for, for the purpose of the discussion today, you know, I'll stick to I'll, I'll stick to the Anurag who is a deep belief in public systems and a deep belief in public education system particularly. And uh, you know, very rarely would you find someone who has such deep, deep footprints in Sarkar Samaj and Bazar all together. You know, you'll find people who have deep footprints in one of them, maybe two of them. But very rarely, uh, you know, people who have deep footprints in all three of them. And Anurag really comes in with uh, a very nuanced understanding of, of the possibilities and the limits of all three of these spaces. So before we get into a longer conversation, Anurag, you know, just you and me, maybe exploring various aspects of the work um, and your journey into the sector, would love for you to maybe initiate the, the discussion today with with maybe your initial starting thoughts, 15, 20 minutes on whatever, you know, whatever you feel like talking about, you know, whether it's the idea of social change or idea of success, uh, the idea of uh, a synergy between Samar Sarkar and Bazaar and why that's important for, uh, for change, the evolution of NEPN. I don't know how many people here know that Anurag along with the team at uh, the Zim Pimj University and Foundation were pivotal in actually conceptualizing and bringing forth the national education policy. So I hand it over to you, Anurag, the floor is, is over to you. I look forward to hearing your thoughts and then I'll get back to you uh, for a deeper conversation after that. Thank you so much. Gaurav, thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, am I audible? All right. So Gaurav, thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, some of it uh, in that introduction, I recognize myself. Some of it, I don't recognize myself. It almost seems as though talking about somebody else. But yes, I continue to love uh, old Hindi songs. I continue to run. And uh, I mean, all I can say is perhaps both of us have aged gracefully. <laughs> so uh, yeah. So good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I've heard so much about what you've been doing, uh, of course, from Ravi, but from others, uh, my colleagues who have engaged with uh, ISDM and, uh, you know, and others. So it's just wonderful to be here. Uh, as Gaurav said, perhaps I'll talk for a bit and then we can have a conversation, maybe perhaps first, first with Gaurav and then with everybody. So uh, let me begin by saying that, you know, when uh, Ravi texted to me two days ago uh, about this session, my first response to Ravi was that 
can we not change the title? So, the Sarkar or Samad Sarkar Bazaar business, right? Uh, and then Ravi said, yes, of course, let's change the title. Uh, he has always been the most gracious of persons I have known. So even at that last minute, he said, okay, let's change the title. And uh, the problem Ravi was that I was somewhere in uh, uh, Ghazipur and Mirzapur, just outside of Varanasi. And I, I, you know, I just didn't have any time to think of anything else other than what I was encountering there. So I couldn't think of it. And then finally, I think yesterday I told Ravi that, well, let's go with it, you know, let's just go with it. <laughs> because like most speakers, uh, I perhaps am perhaps afflicted with the same malady, which is irrespective of the topic you will give me, I'll say the same things. <laughs> That's a well-known problem with people who speak. So I said, let's go with it. But I must explain. And the reason I start there is I must explain as to why my reluctance with that particular title. One is just a, uh, one is just a, let's call it a very superficial thing, which is, you know, that I find that the phrase is getting so used or so often that uh, it's just one of those catch phrases nowadays. That's, that's how it is becoming that particular phrase. But that's, you know, in itself, it's no reason as to why one would not want that title. The, the, the core of the issue in my mind about that phrase, and which is why I did not want the title, but it has given me the possibility of starting from there, is that if let's say I were to use a phrase which was of this kind, the human body, the nose, and the ear, right? The human body, the nose, and the ear. You know, even if one doesn't pay attention to that phraseology, intuitively at a gut feel, one would feel there's something wrong with that phraseology. The human body, the nose, and the ear. If you give it even a single moment of thought, it becomes obvious as to what is wrong, which is you can't say the human body and the ear and the nose as though these are three separate things. Of course, the nose and the ear are separate things, but the nose and the ear are a part of the human body. And which is why the, the internal, you know, let's say disturbance, the moment you would hear a phrase of that nature. And that has been my primary problem with that particular phrase, which is Samaj, Sarkar and Bazaar. And that problem that I'm talking about is reflective of some of the things that have sort of gripped uh, let me just call it civil society uh, and the discourse around the social sector in the past few years, which is Sarkar and Bazaar is a part of Samaj. The core, the starting, one of the starting points of the problems becomes when you start thinking of Bazaar as something outside the Samaj and Sarkar as outside the Samaj, right? And that's, that Ravi was my, uh, my reluctance to use that uh, phraseology. And that reluctance, as I mentioned, is only manifesting at a surface level of what I think is a fundamental sort of a issue with the way the discourse has uh, worked out in the past few years. Uh, now, be that as it may, be that as it may, I want to take that issue. I want to take that issue and I want to take it and connect it to, let's say, civil society, the social sector, NGOs, whatever phraseology you want, you know, because uh, whatever phrases you use, you know, there seem to be people who don't like those phrases. So one can use whatever phrases one likes, but the social sector, the set of people who, at least in their estimate, are wanting to help contribute the country change for better. Right? So let's, let's just talk about that. So I'm going to connect that issue that I started with to what I think are three critical issues that are engulfing the kind of uh, organizations, the kind of spaces, the kind of people that we are. I mean, the group here, outside. Just those three. And then, Gaurav, I'm going to hand it back to you. So, you know, the first one 
The first one is I want to take you back to April this year. Uh, I remember April this year, in the first week of April, I was in um, Jharkhand. And, uh, and then beginning April till July, I was out every week traveling. And I traveled from Jharkhand. That was the first March end. I was in Uttarakhand, but I was in early, first week of April I was in Jharkhand. Then Jharkhand, Telangana, Chhattisgarh, uh, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Uttarakhand, Karnataka. Odisha, and so on, right? So I used to come back home uh, for the weekend, but, uh, or for the Sunday at least, but I was traveling, I think I traveled 11, 13, I think, no, 11 weeks continually. And uh, uh, the reason I was traveling was that all of us are familiar with what happened to the country April through June, July this year, right? It was a, uh, I mean, it, we know it was a cataclysmic, near cataclysmic experience for the for the country. And uh, what I experienced was something which was to do with the civil society. And that was a big part of the reason because of which I traveled. And which was this, that I found that uh, too many of our colleagues you know, colleagues in the civil sector, civil society sector or social sector, they were absent, right? When I say they were absent, you know, and it is totally justifiable, totally understandable that if you have that kind of a pandemic raging through the country and uh, therefore you, your family is, uh, is uh, justifiably fearful of what might happen if you're out there and therefore you are at home, it is completely justified, right? But what I observed was that, and uh, you know, it's a very strange tightrope balance that I always try to walk, which is that I am not here, shall I say, blaming people who are not out there. I'm not blaming them. But there is a deep, question that arises and that's where I'm leading to. So I traveled around and I found that uh, a surprisingly large number of organization and a surprisingly large number of people were uh, inside their homes. And we all know that if this country has had a, had a period where our contribution, our work was the most desperately needed, it was that period most desperately needed, right? And here we were where I want, I would not know, I don't know whether it's the majority or whether it's a significant uh, number, but very large numbers were sitting out it at home, right? And as I said, I'm not blaming anybody because I understand the fears, not just the individuals, but of the families. But the fact is we were sitting out at home. And, uh, and there were two things or two interrelated things. One is that at the same time as we who would classify ourselves as the social sector or the civil society, as much as we were sitting out at home, there were thousands of others who we would not classify as civil society, right? Who are just individuals out there, who are out there doing everything that they could. You know, I mean, provide, from providing food, to actually managing the funerals, right? Never fearing for their lives, never fearing as to what is going to happen to them or to their families. But they were out there and they're not the people we think of as social sector or civil society. But when the need of that kind came, they were there. And too many of us were not there, right? And then the question that I, the question that really started occurring to me is, why are we here? What are we here for? Right? So all of us, uh, all of us, you know, I mean, certainly everybody here, uh, here in my organization and all of these, all of our colleagues in the social sector, we've, we've, we've chosen to be here because we think we want to contribute. We want to help, you know, let me make it very simple, help. So it's like saying that, well, 
you know you raised an army in the peace time and in the peace time the army marched and did exercises and did everything but actually on the eve of war it sort of backtracked you retreated what does it tell us of us right so i don't know i don't know the answer to that question right i don't know the answer to that question all i know is a question worth asking of ourselves what are we here for right i wish i wish that never shall anything of that nature get repeated i mean certainly not in the next few decades but ever again for our country or for the world for that matter but that period should make us ask this question why have we committed to this what are we thinking what do we think is our duty what do we think is our role and is it that that when the time when the war breaks out as it were we retreat right so it to my mind is an existential sort of question you know it's an existential sort of question and uh, like i said it's an existential question that for which i have no answer a bit a bit of this thing that i saw a bit of that this thing that i saw is sort of interwoven in a trend that uh, i think we are engulfed with we again the social sector is engulfed with which is that uh, i think we have uh, <clears throat> we have become too technocratic and uh, what i mean by technocratic is that uh, and there is no there is no uh, there is not the slightest iota of doubt in my head that the technical part of what we do whatever is the technical part whether it's in the health side education side agrarian side <clears throat> wherever the technical part and the managing part and all that stuff is is critical absolutely super important without that we can't we can't do work effectively no question about that so the second point is not about undermining the technical managerial aspect of our work it is that that technocratic aspect seems to have put to side i would say perhaps eliminated what i will call the social political side and uh, i mean that i see i encounter in very simple ways right which is that uh, the question that i think we, we should ask of ourselves is that what is our socio political stand and do we have a stand at all and are we willing to act on that socio political stand or do we think of ourselves as this technocratic organizations which are making a difference to to lives of farmers or to women empowerment or you know or 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 to whatever right but at the same time around us whether we see the cataclysm of april may june or we see injustice on caste lines or we see uh issues of uh, communal harmony or we see issues of uh, you know just injustice with uh, you know people coming from different regions every 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 cleavage every dimension of injustice and inequality we have do we have a stand on that right do we have that and my fear is that over the past 20 25 years uh we have drifted away from that so we have and which is again as i said is not undermining the importance of our technocratic capacities and its significant role in making our work effective but at the same time if we lose our fundamental socio political ethical moorings why are we here the same question as came to me in april may june so that's the second point and the third and the third uh which is uh, in my mind uh, in my mind and that's you know to call it a solution would be uh you know over reductionist and over simplistic so i'm not suggesting a solution but i'm talking about the third point being something which to my mind is a counter to all this is a counter to 
uh, are not being fully conscious of why we are here in all our actions, are becoming technocratic at the cost of losing or missing our social political moorings, our ethical moorings. So the third is, to my mind, the central critical importance of what I call the field, the front line. Too many of us, I think, uh, uh, too many of us, and you know, whenever I say too many of us, I'm not referring to the group here, right? I mean, the social sector, the civil society sector is a vast, vast swath. So too many of us, I think, have progressively become disconnected from the ground, from the field, from the front line. And India is, and these issues are in the front line. Whether in the question, context of schools, it is the government school teacher who's teaching in, the Chanda, in a village in Chandali district, uh, somewhere outside Varanasi, you know, in a broken one room uh, school, or it is the Asha worker, right? Or not just the Asha worker, why Asha worker, right? It is, it is actually the, the young woman who is volunteering to help the Asha worker uh, on the ground. So that is where the issues are. That is where the solutions lie. That is where the heart of India beats. And too many of us, you know, I think are disconnected. Too many of us, and you know, uh, Ravi, you'll have to pardon me if this is a part of your curriculum and if undermines stuff that you've said, too many of us are too fixated on theories of change. I find that phrase, uh, you know, truly partly, uh, you know, what should I say, appalling and partly hilarious. You know, I mean, people have tried theories of change from, you know, from the Bhagavad Gita onwards, and we start believing that we are theories of change. So, you know, the, the kind of abstractions that we are leading ourselves to, engulfed by this technocratic atmosphere, which is cutting us off from the reality on the ground, right? That is, I think, in some senses at the core of this existential, existential problem, right? If you're in a village and if you're connected and if you, if you truly believe that we are here to somehow contribute, you're not going to be, we are not going to be, you know, we are not going to be uh, turning our eyes away if some injustice happens to a Dalit, even if we are working in education or working in health. Right? We will not, we can't do it because we're connected, we're apart, we are there. So this disconnection from the ground, you know, in the flow of these technocratic ebbs, you know, which come from also, I must say so, I must admit, it comes also from people who have money, you know, people like us who are large funders, who, uh, who eventually are pushing not just the discourse, but also the actions in a certain way over the civil society, right? So that's, there are, there is, there is blame to be apportioned on everybody, right? But that doesn't change the description of the phenomena, which is of that of disconnection from the ground, right? So I feel that, uh, I feel that we, uh, we stand at the cusp of something triggered by the pandemic, you know, triggered by the pandemic, at the cusp of something where we can potentially redefine, you know, and improve what we are. And uh, will we do it? Will we not do it? If we don't do it, will we sort of fall apart? I don't know. I don't think history has any such definitiveness, you know, it'll move on. But uh, where we stand today, we are at the cusp of asking these very fundamental existential questions of ourselves, right? And uh, it'll happen if we understand that we are, a, you know, we are just sort of a bit player in the Samaj, right? And we don't have uh, grandiose notions of ourselves or, 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 you know, or we don't have theories of change. So I'll just, I'll just stop with that, Gaurav. It's a, it's a, it's a set of issues which sort of uh, grip me completely. And without hesitation, I will say that they do grip, grip me completely because of what I saw in those three months. And not just, not just uh, what
what I saw in the context of civil society, but what I saw our country, our people, you know, go through. Thank you so much, Anurag. Uh, that was hard hitting um, as usual, and um, uh, definitely soul searching, very, very reflective. And I'm sure it's given us, all of us here, our students, our alum, the entire team here, a lot of food for thought. Uh, so Anurag, you've touched on some very key and critical issues, and maybe we'll start at what is probably the logical beginning in my head. Uh, you talked about civil society as the overarching framework. And you started with that thought. And then in some senses, you almost called in question the role of the civil society and said, hey, what is it that our role is and are we really delivering on that? So what do you think the role of civil society really is um, in the world today or should be in the times to come? I mean, this is a hard question, Gaurav. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, and civil society as a part, as one more part of, let's call it Samaj, right? So government, civil society, bazaar, all a part of society. Yeah. Right? And I must, I must, uh, you know, I must say that, uh, you know, you recollect when, uh, when the first lockdown happened, or even later, people fled, people fled from places like this, people fled back to safety. And what was safety? Mm -hmm. Safety was home, Samaj, you know, their own place. And Bajar and Sarkar and <laughs> civil society didn't matter to them, civil society, right? Everybody. So, uh, the question is what, I mean, if the question is what you, you know, what, what role do I think of civil society? Uh, I know you, you know that there is no definitive simple answer. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Just top of mind, you know, I think, I think that, uh, I think we have to ask ourselves of what are the fundamental values that we aspire for in this country, right? And, uh, what are therefore our ethical commitments and how do we work towards those ethical commitments, right? In, in its comprehensiveness. That to my mind is the key, right? And a disjunction from there. So, I mean, if we say we are committed to equity and justice or, you know, let me put it simply, we are committed to the idea of bringing to life as much as we can from our own contributions, the constitutional values, right? If that is the case, then, well, you are a part of these times and you are here and that's, uh, that's the country you're facing and that's the situation you're facing, then let's do our best, right? That's, that's the, so therefore, in some senses, what exactly one would be doing in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years is not perhaps the same what might have done, what we might have done over the past 15, 20 years. So uh, it is dependent on what times are you facing. And uh, uh, I think the purpose of civil society is to be the, be the, 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 the I won't call it the custodian because custodian is too, uh, you know, too sort of, uh, too presumptuous, but at least uh, uh, an actor who can bring to life the constitutional values, right? That's what I see as the role of civil society. And that's the question that we need to ask ourselves that are we making this happen? Are we, are we working towards this? Are we not working towards this? So, I mean, at a, at a, at a very basic fundamental that level, that's the way I think. The other things that I was mentioning, the other things are questions of method or approach. Yeah. Are we connected to the ground? I mean, yeah. the connecting to the ground is important because else you are not, not really understanding what's going on. Right? You, in the sense, as an individual, as an organization, as an organizational system, you know, systems disconnect you. Right? So, but to me, that's the heart of the matter. Right? Are we here because we are wanting to build the India that we have promised ourselves in the Constitution, and uh, we are doing whatever it takes to make that happen? Yeah. No, absolutely, Anurag. I think you've hit the nail on the head. But the 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 next almost follow up question and. 
I get this a lot because I talk about the role of civil society across multiple forums with young people, with people in the corporate sector. Um, and, you know, we are almost seen as this set of righteous, self-righteous uh, people, sometimes sermonizing, sometimes patronizing. So when you say that we are almost custodians or maybe a lighter word of uh, the constitutional values, are we therefore saying that, hey, corporate, the corporate and the government sector are not custodians or they are the ones who really don't uphold these values or they are the ones who are in violation and therefore we need to uh, be there to safeguard these values. I mean, what are we essentially saying? Well, that's why I actually deleted that word custodian. I think every, every citizen, every individual, every corporation, business corporation, every organization, every political party must be custodian of the constitution and its constitutional values. Everybody must be a custodian. That's why I changed it you know, uh, to saying that we are actors who try and bring to life the constitutional values, right? That's the difference. And it is not the business of a, it is not the business of a corporate, a for-profit business organization to bring the constitutional values to life. The custodians, so they must ensure that there's no, you know, gender discrimination or caste discrimination, that's fine, right? But it's not their business. It's our business to try and bring this to life. That's the difference, the fundamental difference I see, right? Uh, and uh, I mean, and to stay with that, it certainly is the business of the government to make that happen, right? It certainly is the business of the government to make this happen. But, uh, and you know, one can go into political theory a lot, but uh, the fact is that we know governments have their own pulls and pressures. And therefore, the, let's say the architecture of, uh, architecture of uh, a country where civil society is a counterbalance to, uh, you know, to, the, to the state, if I were to call it that, right? inside the overall society, that's an important role to play. So media, I mean, media, I'm not classifying as, uh, as civil society at all. Media has a role to play. Media has a significant role to play in this overall architecture. And our media is totally messed up. And it's poor quality. And <laughs> what does one say about it? Yeah. Right, right. No, fair enough. And Rag, maybe we'll move away from this. Would, lo would love to know more about you as an individual. Is that okay? Absolutely. Whatever you want. Perfect. I'm in Perfect. your hands. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think... And, uh, and, 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 whatever, I must say that... Uh, uh, see, uh, you know, uh, one doesn't need to stick on with, uh, let's say, the... I won't say downbeat, but uh, whatever kind of statement that I started off with. It's not a downbeat statement. It's just a, a it's an attempt at a clear-eyed gaze or clear-eyed look at our own selves. Right? It's an attempt at that. Uh, but one doesn't need to stick to that tone. You know? <laughs> no, no, absolutely. No, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's very important at times to self-reflect. It's important to be critical of oneself and almost uh, reimagine what, we, what we've set out to do and what we're really doing. So, no, thank you for that, Anurag. Um, but I want to come back to Anurag as an individual, as a professional. You know, all of us have had our journeys uh, which have brought us to this space, which have brought us to the work that we've been doing. Would love to know a little bit about what really brought you into this space. You've obviously had a very successful business career. So how did this happen and what brought you here? I, got a, I think it's a series of accidents, basically. So I, uh, this series of accidents, it's, uh, it is that, uh, I mean, most importantly, I think I grew up in a household where, I mean, some of you know my father, I grew up in, my, in a household uh, where this kind of work that I do in education was the work that I knew. So I keep joking with my colleagues that, look, you know, when uh, uh, all of you are all of your bookcases were filled with uh, Enid Blyton and you know Hardy Boys and stuff like that. I saw Paulo Freire and Paul Goodman and stuff like that. I thought that's the stuff to read <laughs> at the age of 10, 10, 12. So I mean, it was a it was just a chance that you know I I was born in the household I was, and uh, and when I say chance, I recognize the extraordinary privilege I've had. You know, I mean, so. It is just an extraordinary privilege that I was born where I was born. My father was, uh, or he's, he is what he is. And uh, I I had that environment that I did. And um, in fact, uh, I must blame myself that despite all that, like any other average middle-class 
kid, I didn't know what to do after school, so I became an engineer. And that was, uh, uh, I, because I didn't know anything better, I became an engineer, I didn't know anything better, so did an MBA. And I think that then the, then the second accident happened, which was a, so the first fortuitous accident was, you know, being born in the family that I was. And it was an extraordinary privilege or is an extraordinary privilege. And of course, the extraordinary privilege of making the, making the decision and, and like most decisions in life, right? I mean, those of you who are maybe in their mid twenties, mid thirties, uh, you know, you perhaps by no, no by now, but you will know later that too much of life or most of life is uh, rarely a planned thing, right? I mean, my life has not been planned. So I remember after MBA, I joined Wipro GE, Wipro GE, which is a joint venture of Wipro and GE, just for one reason, one reason. And, you know, I, I think Ravi is my only contemporary here in age, so Ravi might, might remember this. But, you know, when we were in engineering college, when we were in engineering college, Wipro was a strange company which has a reputation of not bribing whatever happens. So <clears throat> when I finished my MBA, I said, I don't care if anything else, but at least if I join this company, I won't have to bribe. That's how I joined Viproji. I didn't join Viproji because it was some, you know, whatever. <clears throat> then, I mean, that I think was just incredible. And uh, I had the privilege of working in that organization. And then I don't know what, I mean, uh, what happened. And Mr. Premji sort of uh, brought me to the corporate office at Vipro. And uh, uh, like I keep joking with, uh, uh, you know, with very many people. Uh, first of all, I grew up from my you know, like I think age six, seven or something uh, in that world of education, in the world of school education. And then uh, at some point in time, my boss gave me like a eight, nine year, uh, shall I say, internship in school education, which was really because I was the CEO of Wipro Infrastructure Engineering, which is a fairly, uh, I mean, fairly big business. But I was also responsible for all the, uh, all the, let's call it CSR of Wipro actually building that CSR. And so I was doing both these things together. And the foundation, of course, was also being formed with which I was out involved from the outside. But again, you know, it was a, uh, it was just, I mean, I didn't do anything about it. It was just a sort of a blessing that was, that came upon me. And uh, then I moved on at some point in time, Mr. Premji asked me that, uh, you know, look, would you want to move to the foundation? So that's how I moved to the foundation. So uh, there is no, uh, you know, <laughs> There's no wonderful grand narrative, and I find myself completely at loss to explain why is it that I've been so blessed and privileged. And you know, there is no role in the world, uh, not even the president of the U.S., that I would take uh, in exchange for what I do. No, wonderful, wonderful. I've heard this uh, from you, but I wanted the—I uh, mean, I want our audience to also partake with this. So. Thank you so much for sharing. Anurag, we all evolve as individuals. So who I am today was, is really very different from who I was 10 years ago. You've been actively in this space for, uh, what, 15 years now or, or 20 years? I don't know how you want to call it, count it. <laughs> so it's okay. Whatever so maybe, you maybe a decade and a half, maybe two decades. You've been... Yeah, two decades. Call it. Yeah, That's two different. decades. If I was to ask you, how different is Anurag of today compared to the Anurag of, say, 2000? And really, what are some of those things you see within yourself uh, which have significantly changed? It could be perspectives, it could be thought processes, whatever, mindsets, attitude, whatever. I mean, it could be anything. How are you different today compared to what you were 20 years ago? I think uh, the first thing that... Uh, the first thing is that I've become even more conscious of our limitations, you know, my limitations, our limitations, right? And uh, I mean, you know, we just specs in the, you know, in the, <laughs> in the sands of time, right? We just specs. So I think it's, we can just do our best, try our best. Uh, so I think that's, that's to my mind, maybe the most important thing. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know, I mean, I, uh, I feel that, and that, let me relate it back to another comment that I made. That's why my, uh, my, my sort of, 
by being appalled at that phrase theories of change, you know. So Marx also had a theory of change or, you know, Hegel had a theory of change. And so uh, I think we just specs, you know. So I think that over the past 20 years, I've just realized how, how limited we are and how little uh, we can do. And which has not made the importance of whatever little we can do any less. In fact, it has made it, made it even more important because I feel that uh, every little bit counts and the and every little bit, every little bit counts. And in fact, the issue starts happening when we don't have a sense of proportion, when we don't have a sense of proportion and we start thinking that we can change the world, we'll do this, we'll do that. It doesn't happen. And then we say, oh my God, you know, what am I doing? What effect have I had? You know, and so on and so forth. And then we give up or, you know, our, our fire dies down or reduces or whatever, right? And I think if you have the sense of proportion that, you know, anyhow, we are just specks in, a, in the sands of time and every little thing matters, then it's fine. You know? I think you are more satisfied. You do whatever you do better. So I think that's one thing that's happened. The second one is that I think I've become more confident, a lot more confident about what I have treasured always. And I would not have been able to say this uh, with the same confidence uh, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, right? But I've become a lot more confident about, let me just call it simplicity. You know, the importance of being simple, clear, direct. I mean, part of that whole connection to the ground thing that I was talking about is that, right? Well, it's, you know, let's not, <laughs> let's not complicate things. I mean, it's not, I mean, Everything is so complicated anyhow. It's complex. The world is complex. Human beings are complex. But you want to do something, keep it simple. So the importance of simplicity, right? And simplicity starts from your thinking, right? That's where it starts, keeping it simple. Because if you don't keep it simple, anyhow, there are tugs and pulls and pressures that make everything complex, a billion times more complex as you start doing stuff, right? So I think, you know, a sense of proportion, uh, simplicity, and uh, and I would say, and I would say a conviction that uh, a conviction that that this is the thing I want to do, right? That's it. You know, so I have uh, I have no regrets. Uh, None at all. Uh, so this is what I want to do. And uh, I said it and I said it again, you know, and also a recognition. And I think perhaps this is the fourth thing. And I must mention the fourth thing. Perhaps a growing recognition of the extraordinary privilege life I've had. Growing, you know. So eldest son uh, of an IS officer who was involved in education, upper caste. What do you get in this country, right? You know, that kind of education. So... I mean, the extraordinary privileged life that I've had. So a growing recognition in every day with that. Right? Yeah. So I, I don't know, Gaurav, I was, I was not prepared for that question. So I don't know whether I've, I've answered whatever came to my mind. No, beautifully, beautifully answered. Uh, one of the things we used to discuss in the foundation, I don't know if you still say it, is there is some change that will happen during our life. And there is some change that will happen during the civilization's lifetime. <laughs> and one needs to have that sense of proportion that you just talked about. That's true, Gaurav. So I, I must say this. Huh? So for, for instance, the most important role I see for myself at the foundation is not the stuff that I do with a field or the university or now we have significant grant making. The most important work I think I have to do is that uh, I have to figure out a way by this, you know, let's say intergenerational transition of the foundation, foundations, leadership, foundations, management, whatever you want to call it, right? Because, I mean, we're doing this, we're doing something else, we're doing whatever, but the most important thing that we're attempting to do is to set up, uh, uh, let's say, a set up a, a, an institutions which will last for generations. So my job, I mean, most important role that I see is that how do we make sure that from multiple aspects, it's not just about human beings, I mean, in the sense, individuals, it's multiple aspects, but how do we, how do I figure out a way? And when I say I don't mean I alone, my colleagues at the foundation, but how do we ensure that there is 
intergenerational transition, which the generational transition makes the foundation stronger, not weaker. Right. 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 And how is the foundation really attempting to do that? And a little bit of tongue in cheek, Anurag. What is the foundation's theory of change in doing that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I, so foundation's theory of change. <laughs> the foundation's theory of change is that well, you know, you actually don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, right? You have very little control over all that. You can do your best, right? It's a little bit like the Gita, <laughs> which is you can do your best. So, what is it that you could do to? to build stuff and leave behind stuff which will do its best, committed to a certain set of values, right? So we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We are committed to a certain set of values. How do you build and leave an organization that will continue to remain committed to those values and work for it tirelessly? So, sorry, Anurag, let me take a step back and maybe ask a more pertinent question since, see, if you see the vision of the foundation, we talk about just equitable, humane, sustainable society, right? And we at least... I mean, we've chosen education as the primary uh, area of intervention for us to do that, right? So what is, you know, how do you see education really contributing to that? Maybe we'll, maybe that'll be useful for us to, to get a yeah. sense of. So let's take it to two, two different levels. Uh, one level is that, uh, one, one level is how change in education, right? That's one level. And then the other level is, how education changes society. So how change in education? How change in education? Uh, education is the classic wicked problem. There is no one way of uh, approaching that particular matter. Uh, organizations have to make their choices. We think that the most important of things uh, on a prioritization scale, I mean, most important of things on a prioritization scale is the matter of teachers. And therefore, how do we figure out a way by which uh, India has let's call them better teachers and better teachers who are existing and uh, better teachers who then come out from the system. Right? So I'm, I mean, as I think you would all understand, I'm, I'm sort of oversimplifying what we, what we think, but, and that statement of mine is in no way, uh, in no way underestimating the importance of good curriculum or good schools, buildings, or, you know, resources, etc. All that is there, but, you know, if, uh, and I'll just stay with what you said, theory of change, Gaurav, which is that, you know, at the core of it, at the core of it, if you have a good teacher, under a tree, the good teacher can teach students and good education will happen. That's the bottom, right? You don't even need a curriculum. If you have a good teacher, right, the education will happen. And that is at the core of what we are attempting with education. And so how change in education? fully recognizing that education is a wicked problem and will need action on multiple fronts. Our energy we are investing mostly into the matter of teachers. And you know, I don't want to go into the technical phraseology of it that includes in-service teacher and of course, of teacher education system and this and that. So that's, that's the change in education as I see, right? Uh, how education changes the country? Well, uh, you know, if our, if our idea of education, if our idea of education is limited to the notion of uh, physics and mathematics, then it won't. You know, then we will still have the country that uh, we want to change from. But if our idea of education is that uh, every classroom, every school has the culture, and culture is critical here because, you know, what I would call as pedagogical practices inside a classroom are insufficient to be developing let's call them good human beings, good human beings that are practicing constitutional values. Culture is central and critical. And therefore, if our idea of education is education that develops good human beings, and that development is not happening through pedagogical practices alone, but is happening through the culture of the institution, then that changes the country. Right? And, and it's a very slow burn thing, very, very slow burn thing. Uh, it's not something that's gonna happen tonight uh, or, you know, <laughs> in the next five years, but uh, there is no other systematic organized societal process by which something of this nature can happen. Uh, that's not, 
I'm not proposing that the only way of uh, only way of changing our country for the better, uh, better being constitutional values in practice, is school education. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that's the only organized systematic way where you socialize children into what good human beings are and uh, therefore what a good country is. Right? So then I, if I connect both those, if education could change for the better, uh, and primarily I would think through teachers and other stuff associated around the teachers, then that is the kind of education that will develop good human beings, which embody the constitutional values as we imagine them. And therefore, we move towards the goals that we have set for ourselves in the constitution. Right? And uh, I mean, every one, of us, every one of us on this call is familiar that this is the direction and the path. Right? You never get there. I mean, you never get there. right? And uh, uh, it's for us to keep trying. Right, right. And maybe the last question from my side before I open it out to the audience here uh, is, you know, y'all have played a pivotal role in bringing, bringing the NPO, uh, NEP to life. So what are the things in the NEP that, that really talk about what you just shared? You know? What are the most important, according to you, the most important elements of the, the NEP and how does it really bring to life some of the things you've talked about now? So uh, let me mention just three things. Um, the first one is that uh, the national education policy, as when it uh, was sort of developed, that national education policy, and certainly given the context we live in, we meaning the country and the world lives in, there was the most fundamental of questions as to what aims of education would it commit to, right? And if the national education policy were to commit to an aim of education or aims of education, which was to say that, well, let's make e India an economic powerhouse, right? Or to oversimplify it, education for livelihoods and employability. Then we would have gone in a very different direction. And the policy did not do that. The policy is unflinching in articulating that the aim of education is to actually develop good human beings and a good society. And the, and the, you know, and let's say the operating definition of good human being and good society is what we were discussing, which is a commitment to constitutional values, right? So, so I think that is, we, uh, you know, we, we cannot overstate the importance of the choice that was made at that point in time as to what then is the aim of education. Because if it had been something else, we would have gone somewhere else altogether. So I think that's one. The second, uh, the second critical one was uh, the, the choice that the policy made, the choice that the policy made in recognizing that education is a social human process. And again, and you know, I, I alluded to it earlier, education could be envisioned as a technocratic process. It did not do that. It recognizes that at the core of it, at the core of it, education is the matter of relationship between the teacher and the child and the child and the child, right? That's how education happens. That is education. Education is not a technocratic process. It's about this, you know, the deep understanding and bonds that are formed and how minds and hearts change. That's what education is. Of course, there's technocratic stuff around it, right? Of course, no question about it. But the choice that the policy made in committing to the centrality of the idea that education is a social human process, right? So I think that was a second critical. The third one, and which, you know, which is a, which was a very important thing in my mind, which is its unambiguous commitment to public education, unambiguous commitment to public education. And in fact, those of you who have perhaps not read the policy and those of you who have you know, maybe read some op-ed pieces, uh, which seems to criticize the national education policy because it's somehow favoring privatization. All I can say is those who are writing those op-eds have not read the policy, right? Uh, right? So it's unambiguous, unflinching commitment to public education. In fact, uh, a statement which Ravi and uh, Gaurav certainly would remember from our work together, the fact that uh, it, uh, if you go to the 
Interestingly, if you go to the, chap the last chapter on financing, it states explicitly that public education is the foundation of a vibrant democracy. Right? So I would think those three things were absolutely central and are, uh, and you know, are going to form the direction of education and therefore this country over the decades to come. Right, right. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, so let's open the uh, the platform for questions from the audience. So, uh, folks, you have two two options. One is you can raise your hand and you can ask a question live, or the second is you can type your question in the chat window, and I'll be happy to share them. Um, I know that some questions have already come, and Anurag, I'll start taking them up, and uh, the others can and raise their hands, and I'll come to you um, over time. So. Taking it, taking up what you just said, you, you know, talked about the technocratic view of education. Rishmas asked, would love to know what your perspective is about the word technocrat. What do you mean when we say technocrat? What do I mean by what I say technocrat? <laughs> what do I mean by technocrat or technocratic? Technocratic. Technocratic. Technocratic is when we forget that the ha. The heart of the matter is that it's a matter of the heart, right? When we forget that human beings are human beings, you know? So uh, that is what is technocratic. When we start believing that spreadsheets, management systems, um, you know, impact assessment, this kind of stuff, theories of change, you know, this kind of stuff uh, really can help us. And we forget human beings, you know, we forget that we, we care for each other, we love, we, you know, we feel there's injustice, there's dignity, right? So that is to my mind technocratic and with the forgetting, the forgetting of the human being as what she is, is that she's a human being, you know, heart of the matter is, it's a matter of the heart. That to my mind is really technocratic. And as I've been repeatedly saying now, that I'm not undermining the importance of the technocratic stuff, right? That is important, you know, critical. But it's like saying, you know, the, the, if, you, if you take out the spirit and you leave the, leave the body, what is left, right? So that's what I mean by technocratic or technocratic vis-a-vis -vis what I've been saying. Right, and you know, the students, uh... You know, students would know that at ISDM, we keep saying that work in this sector needs to be a combination of the head, the heart, and the hand. Um, and, you know, in some senses, Anurag, what you said also corroborates that. I'll move on to the next question. Pabitra um, is asking uh, your thoughts or asking you for your thoughts on what is a good teacher? Because you said that is fundamental to education. So how do you define a good teacher? So the first thing is that uh, a good teacher, a good teacher has the greatest possible amount of empathy to, to the children. You know? So I think empathy is at the core, really, for a good teacher. Uh, we, we tend to forget this, but uh, you know, when we have teachers, we've actually what we're doing as they are, they are parents, you know, they're semi parents, you know, kids are spending eight hours with them. Right. And we are expecting the teacher to do all that, that we were talking about to develop good human beings. So a good teacher without empathy cannot be imagined. So I think at the core of a good teacher is empathy. Right? So that that's, I think one, two is a good teacher who has a sense of self-control over herself, which is to do with that irrespective of what I am, irrespective of what I am and what my commitments are, in the precincts of the school, when I am a teacher, my commitment is to the education that is envisioned. What do I mean by what I'm saying? What I mean by what I'm saying is, well, you know, I have grown up in an atmosphere where I cannot take away you know, my patriarchal uh, attitudes, for instance. But 
when am I in, when am I in, in, inside the school, I must live the constitutional values. It's a hard thing to do because if I don't, if I don't live the values that I'm talking about or that we are wanting to develop with our children, it is not going to happen. We can keep saying whatever we want to say, but it's not going to happen. So empathy at the core, at in the professional life of a teacher, being willing to being willing to live what you may not believe in actually. Right? But <laughs> as far as you're in school and in education, you live those values that are committed. That's second. Third, and let me just call it the technical aspect. The technical aspect here. Technical aspect, you cannot be a good teacher without, you know, without knowing the subject, you know, without the pedagogical capacity. So just empathy and living the values will be inadequate to be a good teacher, as will be if you just have the technical capacity, which is that of pedagogy and the content. Right? So that to my mind is a good teacher. And, uh, and, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's perhaps by far the most complex role that one has to play in society because you know, when you're a parent, this matter of empathy and this matter of everything else comes naturally to you as a parent. But here you have somebody whom you're expecting to play that role. Not only are you expecting to play the role of the parent, but you're also expecting to play the role of the ideal parent in terms of living those values and have the technical capacity. So what more complex role can one imagine in any society? Absolutely. I'll move to someone on screen. I'll come back to the question on chat. Um, Abhishek, over to you. And let's keep it, Abhishek, let's keep it really short, pithy and, and succinct. Huh? Okay. Uh, so, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, like if we apply to foundation with this discrete data of a good teacher teaching under a tree, uh, without a proper uh, theory of you know any model such as theory of change to ensure that this is how this uh, the program is going to sustain, they would reject the organization because funders, organizations, everyone they are looking for a proper model, looking for how your program is going to sustain, like you know giving out sustainable outcomes, long term sustainable outcomes. So what is your view on that? So it's not TOC, you know what do you believe in? So funders, uh, can funders put their money where uh, their philosophy is? Yeah, they should. Yeah, they, should. they should. I mean, and funders are a big problem. Uh, there's no question that funders are a big problem. And uh, they should. And uh, uh, I mean, we try to. We try to. We also have problems, but we try to. I mean, like, uh, I have no, uh, you know, stuff that we approve. Uh, you know, I'm horrified when people talk about theories of change. And uh, by the way, Abhishek, I don't think there's anything called sustainable uh, change and improvement. Huh? There's nothing of that nature. You just keep you have to keep working at it all the time. So if there's a, somebody who's applying to a applying for a grant to us and who claims that there'll be some sustainable change, um, I'm very doubtful about any such sustainable change. So one part. Funders have been a problem in this ecosystem who have driven this kind of discourse, thinking and action. Funders have been, in some senses, uh, at the core of this technocratic push that has happened in the social sector over the past 20, 25 years. So there's no doubt about that. But uh, I know I'm, I'm hoping that uh, the more we talk about it openly and the more, let's say, I'm willing to say this anywhere, you know, and uh, you know, we have the privilege of being one of the larger funders uh, around. So I'm willing to say this anywhere. So let's see what happens. I mean, this has to be fought. It can't be, <laughs> it can't be one in a day. Right. Thank you. Uh, Sujit. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, it was always inspiring to listen. When I was part of uh, Jim Bramley University, I used to listen very uh, passionately. You. So uh, I have uh, two questions. Uh, you started with uh, Sarkar, Samaj, uh, Sarkar, Bajar, and Samaj. So sir, as you said, Sarkar and uh, Sarkar and Bajar is part of uh, part of Samaj. But now uh, these days, uh, both are seen. Both are seen in isolation. 
so uh, the my uh, question is why uh, why the uh, collaboration is not in uh, action uh, these days and what could be the role of uh, spo uh, and the organization to uh, make it uh, collaborative and the second question is that uh, uh, as as being a st student of stm we are aspiring for authentic development professional what could be the way forward for us as a uh, professionals thank you so you those are very uh, very big questions you know i i don't know i i really don't know whether there can be a comprehensive response um see i feel that uh, i feel that we have to realize uh, re realize is not the right word we have to we have to just accept the world around us currently the way it is so face reality as it is and it has all these problems whether it is the stuff that we were talking about earlier or whether so that's the reality and uh, this reality makes things hard for us uh, very hard for us some of these things become very tough to go back to the earlier question you know i know that there'll be scores of funders who look at theories of change and this stuff kind of that kind of stuff and they'll fund only if you have all that stuff right so uh, it's a hard reality that faces us and it's a struggle so is there is there a simple clear way out of the situation i don't think so and i was using that uh, that funder stuff only as as an illustration right uh i feel that so long as you have the technical capacity and that's why in the context of the teacher i talked about a third dimension being the technical capacity so long as you have the technical capacity and you have a commitment to the kind of values that i was talking about and third if you are willing to accept that look this hard and tough stuff you know we don't want it like this but we got to struggle against this right so if we have that we'll make it work see i, I every one of us who have been who have chosen to be here in the social sector you know i think we recognize that we have not made the easy choice in life right it would have been much easier for you know gaurav is here or ravi you know he is here and the two of them whom i know uh to you know make some billions of dollars and rupees in their corporate careers right much easier it's a it's a far simpler life far simpler life but we have chosen to be here so it's a hard struggle so i would just recommend that uh, having technical capacity having a commitment to certain ethical uh, values and then recognizing recognizing that it's a hard struggle and inherent in that recognition of hard struggle is what i would think is courage you know and uh, courage is courage always is about speaking truth to power and if we don't speak to truth to power then how will things change so i am encouraging everybody that again using that earlier thing as an example you should be i mean those of you who are a part of funders then you have a different story but those of you who are looking for funds you should have the courage to say that look you know this thing doesn't work like this you know there's nothing called sustainable change you know uh, there's nothing of that nature i mean anybody who talks about sustainable change fooling themselves completely so it requires courage i mean i don't know how to sugar coat this stuff uh, it's just tough but you know sujit you chose this life <laughs> so anuprabha anurag anuprabha is asking a question on your on one of your favorite themes he says how can technology bridge the gap in a society that is ridden by digital divide what do you answer that gaurav <laughs> <laughs> you know i would love to hear your response again but it's always wonderful to hear your thoughts on uh, edtech and the role it can play on uh, education for all and and how 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 it can reduce this 
uh, educational divide, if at all. So, uh, you know, is tech an is tech an integral part of our lives? Absolutely, tech is an integral part of our lives. Right. So that's how we are talking to each other. Is tech an integral part of the lives of even those migrants who, you know, whom we forced out of our cities back to the villages a year and a half ago? It's a tech is an integral part of their life also, right? I mean, um, so tech is a part of our life. Pa Tech is today, I think, an intervening layer with pretty much everything that we do. Tech is an intervening layer in our relationships, right? in our most intimate of relationships. So tech is there everywhere. I think we have to recognize that. And we have to recognize as much as we recognize that tech, therefore, is not something. Tech is no longer a tool. Tech is an intervening layer in all our life. And... Uh, once we recognize that, we are also recognizing the, the kind of problems that tech is creating. And forget about what kind of benefits tech can uh, make happen, but the problems that this technology, this intervening layer is creating, we are familiar with that, right? I mean, I don't need to talk about it again and again, you know? So that is the world that we live in. Now, then if one brings it down very specifically to the question about how tech can therefore help in education, because I, you know, Tech in society is so broad that I don't want to go there. I mean, tech as uh, an inflammable or inflammator of passions, which are destroying the very fabric of society. We're familiar with that. I'm not going all there, all, all of there, right? So I'm just, let me just limit my response to the context of education. So tech in education, it can be very useful when used sensibly. And it's completely useless when used mostly in the way it has been used and thought of. So unfortunately, unfortunately, the pandemic has been the most massive possible tech experiment ever because everybody went online. So all the dreams of the tech, <laughs> the tech technoholics just came true overnight. You know, I mean, all education went online. And what is the result of it? We're the most staggering learning crisis that the country or the world is ever facing because tech doesn't work with children. Tech doesn't work with, forget children. You know, Sujit was in our university. So we also went online. How hard was it to handle PG students? They don't study. Education doesn't happen on tech, right? We know that. Why do we want to fool ourselves? So anyway, we've had this massive experiment which has which is, which is told us explicitly and clearly you cannot have this kind of education, tech doesn't work with students, bottom line, right? I didn't want it like this. I have been as Gaurav, that's why Gaurav was laughing <laughs> that uh, I have been saying this loudly for years and years and years now. And I did not wish for this kind of an experiment to happen. The experiment has happened, unfortunately. Now, uh, you know, in, we know that those who are addicted to things, they can't see the basics of things. So even after all this, there are still technoholics who are saying, no, 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 but actually this can happen, this can not happen. So I think let's recognize that tech is not very useful in education with students, right? It's not. Uh, but isn't tech useful? Of course, tech is useful, right? If we use it sensibly. So where is tech useful? I'll give you three examples. Simple WhatsApp stuff which is being used systematically to share content amongst teachers in very many places that we operate. It's very useful. Why won't it be very useful? It's very, very useful. Uh, tech where there is adequate connectivity and tech where the teacher can use to source and content. Is it useful? Of course it is useful, absolutely useful. And in my mind, the most under invested and underutilized potential of tech in education is tech in managing education. I mean, those of you who work with schools, you're familiar, the data is in chaos, the teacher is being asked the same data 100 times, you know, we have no clue where schools are, forget about anything else, right? So this just, I mean, appropriately used, tech can transform the management of the school system. We have not done it. So, uh, so Gaurav, Simple response, let's please recognize after the unfortunate experiment that the 
you know, chance conducted upon education, uh, that tech doesn't work in education in the way we've thought about it. Children don't learn. Of course, uh, I hope all of you who are from the social sector recognize that at the margins, everything happens. So, I mean, if you have 250 million children, certainly some two, three million children might have learned reasonably well through tech, right? But the overwhelming majority of children, because and that's because of the nature of education, of nature of what learning is, right? It's not about connectivity. It's about how education happens, how you hold attention, how you draw motivation, right? The human interrelationship that I was talking about. That's why tech doesn't work in education. However, tech is very useful in education if used appropriately. And unfortunately, because of the, the fixation of tech in the way that we have had over the past few years, <laughs> unfortunately, because of that fixation, we've not used tech where it can be used in So that's it's just a repeat for you, Gaurav, but maybe not for others. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Anurag. Shrikantan, over to you. Good evening, sir. So uh, you mentioned that in the peacetime, we developed an army, marched, and then there was a crisis and the army sat, sat there silently and the whole civil society sat there, a, a bunch of civil society sat there during the crisis and the commoner was doing the seva. Uh, I, I, we've been seeing a certain trend where in the corporate world, a huge amount of experience from the corporate world moves, moves to the, the civil society and tries to create impact. The, the greater leadership, I fail to understand how does the civil society absorb somebody or a whole set of leadership from the corporate sector or the corporate world with years of experience and then asks them or the whole leadership to create impact wherein a, a set is already with experiences of years is sitting ideal as or sat there watching what has happened and the commoner doing the bigger deal, the, the bigger seva. I am confused with that. Uh, Shikanta, I, uh, you know, in the way you put it, and that was the right way of putting it, that uh, uh, a lot of civil society sort of sat out, right, sat out. And some bit of civil society, I don't know, how, I mean, I, I won't place proportions here, but some bit of civil society and what you call the commoner, they were deeply engaged in responding. However, I did not say, and I did not, I did not say because I did not observe that as though the civil society that is engaged in responding was that civil society that was somehow led by, uh, you know, leaders who came from the corporate world. I don't think so. There's nothing of that nature, right? So there was no such thing. So what was the difference between the civil society organizations that had the, let's say that had the courage and the commitment to go out and respond. And what was it that was there inside civil society organizations that did not? I don't know really, you know, I don't know. But it certainly, it certainly would not was a difference in their leadership coming from the corporate world versus being in civil society, right? So uh, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know why that difference happened and why, I don't know why, uh, why organizations behaved the way they did, uh, but they did. But I have not been able to, and I've done it, of, like I was telling you earlier, that I traveled throughout that period. I was not able to find a common sort of a running theme or characteristics across organizations that ended up responding and that did not end up responding. It is just that they were who ended up responding and they were not, I mean, they were those who did not respond. Sure. Thank you, uh, Asim. So we'll take a few questions from the team now. Um, so Asim, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Gaurav. Good evening, uh, Anurag. Uh, thanks for sharing uh, your insights uh, from, from uh, your experience in the education sector. Really appreciate it. Uh, Anurag, you said uh, we are just a speck in the sense of time. I just want to uh, check with you in your experience in the education sector over all these years. Uh, is there any uh, any one instance uh, that stands out where you realize that uh, despite how much of a small uh, and individual maybe uh, the 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 belief and the work of that individual in the sector really brought uh, a lot of joy to you and happiness of what you really saw tr uh, transforming on the ground. 
uh, Asim, uh, unfortunately, I would say every day. Every day. Right? So uh, it is just incredible, incredible how many instances that I see driven by people of commitment, you know, who are specs in the sands of time, as you said and I, I said. But uh, the difference that they've been able to make is just extraordinary, right? I mean, I, I can't, uh, every day, absolutely every day. There's nothing that I can say beyond that. So, and I, uh, I mean, those of you, Gaurav mentioned that I write for the Mint, those of you who have read a few of my columns, you would know that I deliberately, I deliberately pick up those kind of instances, which, uh, you know, which is truly remarkable. And there's so many of them, so many of them, right? So, I mean, uh, I'll give you one of the most dramatic ones, one of the most dramatic ones in the past few months. And I remember it because at April, May, June period that I was talking about, right? I, I, so I remember in the month of June, blazing June, Right, I was in Barmer, and you know, lockdown. The pandemic is ravaging the country, absolutely ravaging the country, and uh, and you have this young man uh, who lives actually in the town of Barmer, and every day he would uh, ride uh, some 15, 17 kilometers, and those of you who are familiar with that territory of the country, he will go to a one particular farmer's small, really one room place, huh? and which had, uh, which was just open on all sides. And he will sit there and there will be, there were some 17 kids who would come from the neighboring dhanis whom he will teach, right? But why was he doing it, right? I don't know. I mean, and if you ask him, why is he doing it? You know, he said, look, you know, I mean, what else do I do? I mean, I'm here. These kids are here. You know, I had to make a difference to their lives. And you should have seen those kids. So I, every day I see, I mean, it's just, uh, it's just staggering. And to me, to me, that's the, that's another, it's the energy part of being connected with the ground. That if you are connected with the ground, you know, then you don't see theories of change. Then you see the heart of the matter, which is what you see every day this, right? Of course, you'll see a lot of nonsense, right? You will see, <laughs> you know, you will see uh, injustice and you will see a teacher who comes drunk to the school, all that you will see. But then to counter that, you see this, this incredible stuff. Right? And uh, Gaurav was asking me how I have changed over the past 20 years. And I was saying I have become even more convinced. And a part of that conviction draws from this, that there are so many good people, you know, so many good people. So many good people who will not give up, you know, who will be unfazed, who will have courage. Yeah. Thank you, Anurag. Thank you. I'm conscious that we have five minutes. Um, and we still have multiple questions that we haven't touched. Um, so I'm going to, sorry, I'm, I'm just going to have to pick and choose right now. I'll go to Kamini because uh, I think she had put her question some time back. Uh, Kamini, would you like to state your question or would you like me to just... I would like you to ask Muzaffar's question because there are several students who voted for Muzaffar's question. So okay. I think that's good. That will be good. I'm happy to bypass mine. Great, great, great. Uh, so, uh, Anurag, this is a little bit of a political question this is regarding Kashmir and the role of Sarkar Samaj and Bazaar in terms of what's happening in Kashmir today. And you know, Muzaffar says... In this context, in the context of what's happening there, what is the way forward, particularly if we talk about the role of civil society? And I'll add uh, Kamini's question to this because they are linked in some senses. She says, you know, what is your response to Mr. Doval's view uh, of civil society as the enemy of the nation? How do we counter this view? <laughs> So, uh, Kashmir. See, uh, I don't know enough of Kashmir and the ground situation myself. I haven't been there for 
two decades now. So I, I don't know. I know it's I know it's very complicated, very tough, very difficult, right? So that is the only thing I know. So I won't have a, you know, I won't have, I don't naturally, I do not have any strategic quote unquote insight uh, into what should be done, what can be done, right? There's two things I know, which is that uh, one is that, you know, you, you cannot solve any problem. You cannot solve any problem without uh, winning the hearts of people. Right? That, whatever the problem be, whatever the problem be. So you cannot solve the problem by without winning the hearts of people. So unless you take people along with you, unless people feel that you are with them, and you meaning you is whoever, which is the government of India, which is the Kashmir, the, the, you know, the political parties in Kashmir, different uh, civil society groups in Kashmir, whatever be the groupings, right? So I don't know. But I mean, the idea that somehow we will solve the problems of Kashmir without winning the hearts of people, it is totally unreal. You know? That won't happen. I mean, and, uh, uh, you know, once you read history, recent history, long history of the of humanity, there is not one instance. There is not one instance where you've been able to solve a problem without winning the hearts of people. Right? So it is not going to happen. Right? So I don't know. I have no idea what needs to be done, who's going to do it, but you have to win the hearts of people. So I think that's one. And the second thing is, and the second thing is, you know, I say this with, uh, with, uh, say this, uh, knowing that I have no right to say this, right? Because I'm not there. You know, I have no right to say this because I'm not in Kashmir. But uh, uh, but to me, it is what I said about the pandemic, that it's unfortunate. We live through these times. We are caught in it. But we should do whatever we must, you know, and whatever be the outcome. Right? Whatever be the outcome. We as civil society, we must do whatever be the outcome. I mean, if you're in the cross, if we are in the crosshairs of... Uh, "Quote unquote," the uh, the terrorist organizations because of doing something that we are doing, so be it. If we are in the crosshairs uh, mistakenly in the of the government because of whatever we are doing, then so be it. You know, I mean, you have to do what the, what the right thing is. And uh, I say that, and I must say again, I have no right to say it because I am not there. Uh, right? I can only say things with uh, which I myself can do, but since the question is asked of me, that's what I think. So I don't, I, <laughs> that's such a hard question, Muzaffar. <laughs> yeah, such a hard question. On Mr. Doval's civil society stuff, uh, I don't know, you know, I think Mr. Doval is a very intelligent man, very intelligent, very, uh, very sharp man. Uh, I think his understanding of India's uh, polity society, I think is quite remarkable. So he's a very, uh, very insightful person, I would think, you know. Uh, I've met many of the present, uh, uh, let's say, people who have, uh, uh, you know, positions of responsibility. Uh, I think he stands out amongst them, amongst the very best from his understanding and insight perspective. Uh, and therefore, in what context he said something of that nature, why he said it, I don't know. You know, I don't know. I don't want to second guess him. But uh, civil society, as we understand it, as we are, we are not the enemy of the uh, the nation or the enemy of this. Uh, we are, in fact, we are the nation, right? Uh, we are the nation. I mean, not the entirety of the nation. That will be again very presumptuous. But we are the nation. So. What do we do about it? I mean, we just go on with our business. You know, why should we take it too seriously? You know, I mean, I think one of the problems that I find is we take a few, we take a few headlines too seriously. Right? We just take a few headlines too seriously. Uh, the problems that are being encountered by civil society organizations on the ground, they are there irrespective of the statement that uh, we are talking about and not talking about. So they are just there. So we got to do our business. We got to do our work. We got to do stay committed. Uh, and that's it, you know. So I won't, 
I mean, I won't take that particular statement as though now there is some kind of be <clears throat> there's some dramatic shift of uh, uh, this government or this uh, or, or Mr. Doval himself in the perspective of civil society, right? So I don't know. I mean, it, I'm I'm just uh, some of you work with the government very closely. Uh, I don't pay too much attention to headlines, you know. The headlines are what they are. And uh, we have to just go at it, you know. And if, I mean, if I were to counterpose that point in the context of Kashmir, is it tough? Of course it is tough, right? So we can hang up our boots and go back to the pavilion if we want. But that's not what I signed up for. Right, no, absolutely. Uh, so before we close this out, uh, Ravi, would you like to would you like to add some closing comments, thoughts? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Dara. Um, you know, if uh, Sujit talked about uh, how we talk a lot and discuss a lot about being authentic development professionals. Um, and if there is an example of authenticity that I would use, it would be uh, Nurag. He doesn't care a damn about what you think or you know what you feel about it. Uh, he is authentic to the core, and uh, and uh, Nurag may, you know, may not realize this, but uh, the genesis of ISDM goes back to conversations he and I must have had in the corridors of our office in Sajapur or in our drives to Tarkashi or sitting in the you know forest in Pattisgarh or whatever it is but he was the one who had asked, started by saying and I and I remember I was this MBA having worked in the corporate world fairly successfully I thought and he said management is the biggest nonsense in the universe and you know I remember those famous statements of his and that is also what got me going in this direction of asking that what is management and what is it in the social sector context um so yeah, Anurag, you had a huge role to play in, you know, shaping my thoughts and in effect shaping ISDM and in effect shaping so many people who have passed through or had some association with ISDM. Uh, and it didn't stop there because uh, it then was your father who carried us for the next, you know, several years. Um, I don't hero worship anyone. Uh, I, I just think human beings are human beings. But if I had to pick one person to hero worship, it would be your father. He's played a huge role in shaping our thoughts and directions and stuff like that. Uh, the two words I always associate with uh, Anurag, which I believe is very important for being authentic, and I heard it again today and I felt it, and I, I can't tell you how happy I am, is his idealism and his irreverence. Uh, and I think those are phenomenal qualities if one could pick from Anurag, I would strongly recommend. Um, uh, and I believe in the social sector, you should have uh, is too in abundance. Uh, uh, so yeah, it's just so wonderful listening. And Anurag, your comment about our curriculum and whether you're punching holes, we don't have a deterministic approach at all at ISDF. It's all discussions and debates and you figure out your lives. In fact, it was your father who taught us that uh, it's not one class that goes as you know a group of widgets who have the same experience. Every student, Muzaffar from Kashmir to Gandhi from his plays are all different and their journeys are all different and they go out also in it. So we tend not to be too deterministic about it. But I also think that Anurag is a, his thinking at least is of a much, much higher order than most of us tend to think and it can confuse a hell out of a lot of you. So you should continue to debate, you should continue to discuss these. So these are thoughts which are have come out like he said he's been reading you know Freire from his the age of 10 uh, some of us have not yet read you know Paulo Freire and people like that so these are based on very very deep insights experiences etc cetera, etc cetera. and they're definitely worth reflecting and discussing and I hope some of you will discuss it in the in the small groups and classrooms and whatever spaces I know we have um, so incredibly uh, grateful to Anurag for, I've been pursuing him, by the way, for six years to get him to talk to ISDM, so I can't tell you how it is worth it. Uh, so uh, uh, it's just that five batches have missed out on you. I hope some of the alums have joined and have listened to you. But really, really grateful because these are the thoughts that I believe will shape, you know, the minds of some of the young people who are listening to this conversation and will, you know, find their own sort of uh, 
uh, incredibly grateful to you, uh, Anurag, for being, you know, being Anurag. And, uh, you know, I, I agree with you when you responded to Gaurav and said, which Anurag? And, you know, a different Anurag turns up every time I have a conversation with Anurag. And I don't mean by that he's confused. I mean, he has so many identities. I read him in the, in the Mint. I talk to him as a friend. I work with him in the organization. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's just, just phenomenal. And, uh, Anurag, thank you so much for making all the time. I know a lot of people would have had, wanted to continue these conversations. Uh, uh, it's it, always okay, like, you know, we used to say in the institute, we hold your questions, it's okay. You don't have to answer everything. So we shall end on that note saying, keep your questions and try and figure out your answers also. But uh, incredibly, incredibly grateful to you, Anurag. Uh, mm -hmm. grateful to you know the students and Mukund and everybody else who organized this um, and all of you who spent then you know Saturday evening uh, here just being part of this conversation um, thank you so much uh, and and Gaurav I'm glad I was not on the other side of your questions um, uh, you know thank you Gaurav for being <laughs> the amazing uh, anchor you are um, and yeah thank you to everybody yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot, Ravi. Uh, thanks, Gaurav. And uh, thanks, Anurag. And thanks to the academic team, everyone. And Gaurav, thank you for being a great host for us. And thank you so much, Anurag, for sharing your insights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye, Anurag. Good night, thank you everybody. So much. Can I request Bye, one more for uh, picture? Just yeah, let's put everybody's videos on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I request everyone to turn on their videos. Thank you, Anurag. Thank, thank, thank you so you. much. Good night, everybody. Bye bye. Good night. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.